The Center for Multiscale Theory and Simulation is a National Science Foundation funded research center and it's devoted to the problem we call the multi-scale problem, which is uh, a physical problem that has uh, different scales that are all coupled together. The best example is a single cell. Uh, a cell has everything from the proteins and the membranes to you know, its organization at a higher level in it. and it's an extremely difficult problem to describe that based on sort of physical theoretical concepts of how to write down the equations, how to solve the equations, how to predict things using computers. So that's basically what the center is devoted to. The core methodology approach of the Center for Multiscale Theory and Simulation is based on theoretical chemistry. So theoretical chemistry is the use of mathematics and computers to solve problems related to chemical phenomena. What we care about is the theory of why atoms and molecules move and behave the way that they do. Everything that, that, that we want to do, whether it's uh, understanding disease, designing drugs, designing new materials, uh, solving renewable energy challenges, they begin at the molecular level. How do we take what, what we know about quantum mechanics, about what's called statistical mechanics, about biology, how do we put all that together to solve these hard problems. So theoretical chemistry is right at the heart of that. It's understanding how these, these molecules behave collectively. But the ability to model, to understand conceptually, to describe mathematically what's going on is essential. Otherwise, you don't have a framework to understand what you're seeing. Experiment gives us a lot of data. It gives us observations. But theory tells us how to interpret those observations. And even more than that, theory tells us how we can change conditions or how we can try to modify the system to get better results in the future. By its very nature, theoretical chemistry, by addressing those fundamental problems, is extremely interdisciplinary. Some of the best people that come to my research group are not necessarily chemists. I get engineers and physicists. The benefits of things like the CMTS is it brings together people from different fields with their own individual specialized knowledge and helps to place them in an environment where they can collaborate and we can begin to address these very difficult scientific problems in a collaborative manner. Currently it's thought by the World Health Organization that somewhere around 35 million people in the world are currently infected with HIV. But there are still significant gaps in the picture that we need to understand to really get a full picture of how HIV is capable of infecting people. When a cell is infected with HIV, there's a certain set of processes that need to occur for the actual um, virus to be able to infect other cells. First of all, we have a sort of aggregation of certain molecules inside the infected cell which then forms a sort of spherical shape which is released from the cell itself. But when it's first released, this spherical shape is not actually infectious and we refer to this sort of spherical construction as a virion. The immature HIV virions are spherical and the mature HIV virions are also spherical. It's what goes on inside the virion that's important. So whereas before we effectively have something that looks a lot like a string of pearls, and this is a molecule we refer to as the gag molecule, and during the maturation process, the gag molecule is split up into individual smaller molecules under the action of certain enzymes. And it's these molecules that are then released from the gag peptide that are actually capable of doing certain tasks inside the virion as it's maturing. And these tasks are obviously very important to make sure that the HIV virus is capable of infecting other cells. But what we're lacking is really this dynamic picture of what happens in the intermediate stages. My research is fundamentally based on these three-dimensional simulations of these simplified molecules. So pretty much everything I do is either attempting to rigorously generate these models in the first place, or then to apply these models towards the sort of biophysical systems that we're interested in studying, such as HIV. So the computational models give us some sort of an indication as to what happens in the meantime. You know, um, how does this actual cone-shaped structure form? What are the important steps in this process that we can then try to understand better and we can try and design medical treatments that would maybe interfere with this process so that the HIV virus is then no longer capable of infecting other cells. 